can see it. Yes, we can see. All right, so thanks again, Andre, for the introduction and also, of course, for the invitation to be the first uh, speaker in your seminar. So what I'm going to present today is a joint work with Andre and also with uh, Majid Samani from the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, <clears throat> At the beginning of my presentation, I will introduce infinite interconnections of control systems. And then I will directly come to the small gain approach for input to state stability of such inter interconnections. One very important ingredient in this small gain approach is what we call a path of strict decay. So in the third section of my presentation, I will explain what that is and how to construct it. Finally, I will end with some open problems and also references. So be before I come to the interconnections, one slide about our motivation for this work. In the modern world, networks become larger and larger in terms of their components or the number of subsystems which make up the network. And the classical tools which are used for the stability analysis of such networks do usually not scale well with the size of the network. One idea how to overcome this problem is to over approximate a large but finite network with an infinite network and then develop the stability analysis for this over approximation. And in the best case, this should lead to results which are then independent of the scale or the size of the network. So let me show you first the technical setup that we use to study interconnections of infinitely many control systems. So in this talk, I will consider countable families of control systems, each of which is given by an ODE, as you can see here. So this is the system sigma i, where xi is the state. That's an element of some Euclidean space, rni. Then we also have some xi bar in the right-hand side. This is considered as an internal input. And formally, xi bar is a vector composed of the states of other subsystems. More precisely, we consider a finite set of indices, capital I index small i, which should not contain i. And xi bar is just uh, the vector composed of the xj's with j running through this index set. We also have an external input ui, which is usually considered as a control, but can also be considered as a disturbance. Finally, we have the right-hand side, this function fi, which should at least be continuous. And of course, we need to talk about solutions. So what we do is we just assume that um, for every initial state xi zero and for all essentially bounded functions xi bar and ui bar, so these are time dependent functions that we can put here on the right hand side. There exists a unique solution which we denote in this way. We will only be interested in the solution for non negative times. And we don't assume forward completeness. So these solutions might only be defined on bounded time intervals, at least at this point um, of our setup. So one should be aware here that, well, I called the XI bar internal input and the UI external input, but the XI bar here, just when we talk about solution, it can be any essentially bounded function. Later, when we introduce the interconnection of all of these systems, XI bar will be, um, well, a vector composed of the states of other subsystems but not at this point. Now there is a final very important point of the modeling. So what we also need is a norm on each of these spaces. 
So we equip each of the state spaces R and I, and also each of the input spaces R M I, with a norm that can in general depend on the index I. Nevertheless, we will um, not highlight this dependence in our notation. So we just use this notation without any index for each of the norms. But since we will be talking about stability, in particular input to state stability, which is a notion depending on the choice of the norm, well, the way we choose these norms will change the meaning of the statements of our results. So you should keep in mind that this is an important part of our model. Now we can introduce the interconnections of these systems sigma i. So for that, we need to introduce first a state space. This will be uh, some L infinity type space, more precisely the space of all sequences xi, where xi is an RNI, and the supremum over the norms of the xi's is finite. And this supremum is also, of course, the norm that we put on this space. And with this norm, it's a Banner space. Then we have a space of external input values, which we model in exactly the same way, just using the norms on those spaces R, M, I. We also need to talk about input functions, time-dependent input functions. Um, so here we use also bounded functions from R plus into our space of external input values but only those which are piecewise right continuous. Well, we could also consider measurable con control inputs or external inputs, but this would lead to a different analysis and somewhat different um, statements. So here in this talk, I will concentrate on piecewise right continuous functions. And finally, we need a right-hand side for this infinite interconnection. So this is just a map f on x times u, and it's composed of all the right-hand sides of the sigma i's, just like that. Then we can formally write the interconnection as an ODE, like that, with a state x, which lives in this Banner space, capital X. Well, of course, <coughs> to handle such an ODE, we need to talk about solutions. We need to introduce a concept of solutions. <coughs> and this will be the following. For a pair ux0 of an input function and an, an initial state, we call a function lambda on an interval of that form with values in x, a solution of the Cauchy problem that you can see here. If that function is locally Bochner integrable with values in x, and satisfies the integral equation associate, associated to our differential equation. So we don't really talk about derivatives, we just talk about integrals. And so this works fine. So there is a, a well-established theory handling such solutions. Now we need, also need to introduce some properties. We say that our system sigma is well posed if for every pair ux0 a unique maximal solution exists and we denote it in that way. <coughs> so also, sorry, also this solution may only be defined on a bounded time interval. But if actually all of these maximal solutions exist on the whole um, non-negative half line. So if this maximal existence time is infinite for all pairs, then we call the system forward complete. If it's also well posed, of course. Finally, we need to introduce a property which is called the boundedness implies continuation or for short big property, which is satisfied if the system is well posed and all of its bounded maximal solutions are defined on R plus. So essentially this means that whenever you have a bounded solution and it's only defined 
well, you only know that it exists on a bounded time interval, then you can extend it to a larger time interval. And eventually, as long as it, as it stays bounded, you can extend it to the whole R plus. So, all right. Then uh, another important thing is, of course, the relation between the solutions of uh, the system sigma and the solutions of the subsystem sigma i, which are now considered as subsystems of this <coughs> interconnected system sigma. And that's very simple. If you take a solution of the system sigma and you consider the projection to the i's component, then you obtain the corresponding solution of the subsystem sigma, just like that. Now, to talk about stability properties, as usual, we need to introduce some classes of comparison, fu comparison functions. So we have first a class P, so of positive definite functions. These are continuous functions, which are zero at zero and positive at all other points. <coughs> then we have the well-known K functions. So which are those positive definite functions which are strictly increasing, K infinity functions, which are those K functions which are additionally unbounded. We have L functions, which are continuous functions that are strictly decreasing and they decrease to zero. And we have finally KL functions, which are continuous functions of two arguments, which are K functions in the first and L functions in the second argument. So here are some illustrations uh, for these different classes of functions. I think I don't have to say very much about this. And I can just continue uh, with the central definitions. For these central definitions and all that follows, I will assume that our system sigma is well posed and has the big property. So you can take this as a general assumption that we will always assume in the following. So input to state stability, that's our central notion. We call the system sigma input to state stable or ISS if it is forward complete and there exists beta in KL and gamma in K infinity such that this inequality holds. So that means, well, maybe first we should look at the case when the input u, the external input is zero. Then the term here just completely disappears because the norm is zero and gamma of zero is zero. In this case, the notion just reduces to uniform global asymptotic stability. Now, if we have here for u a function different from zero, we see that as time goes to infinity, this term here goes to zero. And in the limit, we just end up with the term depending on the norm of u. This means that the norm of the solution decreases um, if x or the norm of x is um, large in comparison to the norm of u. And finally, we will end up in the ball centered at the origin whose radius is equal to this term. So this is the classical notion of input to state stability. And as probably all of you know, most often input to state stability is verified by constructing an ISS Lyapunov function. So in our context, I will define ISS Lyapunov functions as follows. So this will be a function V from the overall state space X into R plus, which is continuous, which satisfies that, well, which satisfies an estimate like this with K infinity functions, Psi one and Psi two. So this inequality is sometimes also called, um, or these estimates are called coercivity estimates or coercivity bounds. And finally, 
maybe the most important property is, um, well, the property about the orbital derivative of V. So here V is only assumed to be continuous. So it's not clear um, if um, the derivative exists, but we can always talk about Dini derivatives, which you see on the bottom here. So um, we define uh, this Dini derivative of uh, V with respect to a control input U and a state X, just like that. So it's the lim sup for t going to zero from the right of this quantity. And the property here says that if v of x is larger than gamma of the norm of u, then this orbital Dini derivative should be not larger than minus alpha of v of x. So of course, if you combine this with the coercivity bound, then you see that it means that when the norm of x is large in comparison to the norm of u, then we have a decay. The function v will decrease along the solution, which is more or less what we also have here, right? So this makes sense. So now we already come to the small gain approach. So, and we will be using, of course, the following central fact. If we have an ISS, sorry, an ISS Lyapunov function, as I just introduced it, then the system is ISS. So this is the way that we prove ISS by constructing an ISS Lyapunov function. And of course, this leads to the central problem, how to construct such a Lyapunov function. And in this talk, we use a small gain approach to do this which essentially means that we construct the V from ISS Lyapunov functions of the subsystem sigma i. So let me also introduce Lyapunov functions for the subsystems. So that's a definition and also at the same time an assumption. So for each index i, we assume that we have a function V i on the state space of sigma i which should be continuous and continuously differentiable outside of zero. Again, we assume that we have coercivity bounds like that. And we assume that we have a, like a similar implication as we had in the definition of the Lyapunov function for the interconnected system. Here it's a little bit different because I mean, the main difference here is that we not only consider the external input in this inequality, but also the internal inputs. And we do it in that way. We assume that there are functions gamma ij, which should be k functions or zero. Actually, they are zero if j is not contained in this set of uh, neighbors of the subsystem sigma i. And there should also exist gamma i u in k and alpha i in p, such that we have this implication here. So if the value of v i at x i is larger than this number, that depends on the values of v j at x j, or if you like, depends on the norms of the x j, and also on the norm of u i, then we have this inequality. Here we assume that the, C, the VIs are continuously differentiable outside of zero, so we can actually uh, write the orbital derivative in that way by using the chain rule. That's the main difference. And so the, those functions will be called ISS Lyapunov functions for the sigma i. The gamma i chase will be called internal gains and the gamma i use external gains, right? If you, have a, if you have a question, by the way, please interrupt me. So now there is another important object that we need to introduce for this small gain approach. It's called the gain operator. So in the small gain approach, it's important that the couplings between the subsystems 
are sufficiently weak. To describe what that means precisely, we introduce the gain operator, which combines the influences of the subsystem sigma i on each other. And this gain operator is an operator which is defined on L infinity plus, which is the standard positive cone in L infinity. So this consists of all real sequences SI with all entries being non-negative. And then we use the internal gain functions gamma ij to define this operator in the way as you can see it here. Of course, we could take the supremum here also only over j in i index i, because the gamma ij's by definition are zero if j is not in this set. But we can also write it in that way. Now, in general, this operator doesn't have to be well defined, but we can prove that if the family of all the internal gains, so that's a family of functions, if that is pointwise equicontinuous, then the operator is well defined and also continuous. Moreover, this operator maps zero to zero, which is quite obvious. And it's a monotone operator with respect to the order which is induced by the positive cone. So that means if we have that inequality, then we have the same inequality for the image of S1 and S2 under gamma. And as I said, that's the order induced by the cone. So S1 less than or equal to S2 just means that the same inequality holds component-wise, all right? So this is also easy to see. Now there is one important ingredient that we need to construct the, the ISS Lyapunov function V from the VIs. And this is what we call a pass of strict decay for the gain operator gamma. And basically the existence of such a pass of strict decay will be our small gain condition. Now let me give the definition of a pass of strict decay. That's a function sigma from R plus into this positive cone, which has a couple of properties. The first in properties, sorry, the first property is the most important, I would say. It says that if we evaluate our gain operator on the image of this mapping sigma, then we see that we, we get, we have a decay. So we get a vector which is smaller in terms of the order defined on the, defined via the positive cone. So we have sigma of sigma r is less than or equal to something like this. So what is this? The rho is a k infinity function and we take here identity plus rho inverse. So, I have to explain what that means. How can I compose such a function which is real valued with sigma, which has values in, in, in this cone? So that means that we apply this nonlinear function component wise to sigma of R. And since identity plus rho will be something which lies above the identity, if we take its inverse, it will be below the identity. So this really means that we have a strict decay, all right? Then we have some other properties that need to be satisfied. In particular, each component function, sigma i of sigma should be a k infinity function. Then we need uniform bounds on these components, sigma min and sigma max, which are also k infinity functions. And finally, we need a uniform local Lipschitz condition for, this, for the inverses of the sigma i's. For every compact interval k in the open interval zero infinity, we want to have like these Lipschitz estimates from above and from below with constants small c and capital C, which can depend on that set k. So this thing we call a pass of strict decay. And now finally, I can uh, show you how we obtain the Lyapunov function for the overall system sigma. 
So we assume that we have those Lyapunov functions vi for the sigma i and additionally a path of strict decay. Then we define v of x in the way that you can see here. So we take the supremum over sigma i inverse of vi of xi. So this will be our Lyapunov function. And here you see uh, some additional assumptions which really guarantee that it is a Lyapunov function. First, we need that the functions c, psi, i1 and i2 that come from the definition of Lyapunov function for the subsystem, those coercivity estimates, that they are uniformly bounded over i, just like that. Then, of course, we need, as I said before, pointwise equicontinuity of the family of internal gains. And we also need an upper bound on the external gains in terms of another k function that we call gamma u max. Um, third assumption here is that we have um, a uniform Lipschitz condition on the Lyapunov functions of the subsystem. So these are only local Lipschitz conditions. For each r, we want to have a Lipschitz constant L of r such that this holds whenever the norms of xi and yi are at most r. So within a ball of radius r centered at the origin, we want to have like a uniform Lipschitz estimate. Finally, we need the existence of some alpha tilde in P, which is a lower bound on all the alpha i's. So the alpha i's also come from the definition of the Lyapunov functions of the subsystems. And so the theorem says that under these assumptions, the V as I defined it here is really an ISS Lyapunov function for sigma. So implying that sigma is ISS, of course. And moreover, this function can be shown to be locally Lipschitz outside of zero. So that's our main result. Now let me say a few words about its proof. So what do we do? We take some x in the state space, which should not be zero. And we first consider all indices i, such that this function or this, I should say this number is close to v of x. More precisely, we introduce this set i of x. So this being close to that can be expressed in the following way. We apply identity plus rho, which the rho comes from the definition of path of strict decay. We apply this function to vi of xi, which will make this value a little bit larger, depending on what rho is. So, and then we apply sigma i to the minus one, and we want this to be strictly larger than v of x. So that means that without the rho here, we should already be close to v of x. And since v of x is defined as the supremum over these quantities, it should be true that v of x then is the supremum of these quantities if we only take indices from the set i of x. And in fact, this can be proven. So this is true. Now, to verify that v is an ISS Lyapunov function, we need in particular a k function gamma that we use to compare v of x with the norm of u. So we define gamma as a composition in that way. The sigma min comes from the definition of path of strict decay. And this thing here was our upper bound on the external gains. Now we assume that this inequality holds for some external input u. Then for every index i in the set i of x, we get two estimates. First estimate is this one. We i of x i can first be lower bounded by this here, which just comes from the definition of i of x. And then in the second inequality here, we use the property of path of strict decay. So this is just the decay condition that we use here. So we get this inequality where 
gamma i means that we look at um, the i-th component of gamma. Now, this equality is just the definition of, um, of the gain operator gamma. And finally, the last inequality just comes from the de definition of V because V of X is defined as the supremum over sigma J inverse of V J of X J. So we can lower bound it in that way. So this is the first estimate. Then the second, here we use directly our assumption V of X is larger than gamma of normal U. And with all our definitions, this leads to VI of XI is lower bounded by gamma IU of norm of UI evaluated at zero. Now we can put these two estimates together and we get that VI of XI is bounded below by the maximum of this number and this number. Now let me go back a few slides. Now you see that we exactly get the estimate that we have here in the definition. So this definition tells us that then we know that this estimate on the orbital derivative will hold. So let's go back to the proof. So we know that this estimate will hold and we assume that the alpha i's are lower bounded by some alpha tilde. So we also have this estimate. So this is true uh, for all indices i in i of x. Actually, we can show a little bit more. If we consider not only x, but the solution starting in x, when we use the control u, and denote by phi i of t the i component of this solution, then we can prove this inequality here for sufficiently small t's. So if we put t equal to zero everywhere, we get this inequality. So we can somehow extend this inequality a little bit to get this here. Now we can immediately use this inequality to get an estimate on the quantity that we are interested in, which is this here, the Dini orbital derivative. So actually also without the lim soup, well, we can, we can estimate this guy here like that. And then we can further estimate this difference here by using the inequality above. Well, what we also need is we, will, we need to get rid of the sigma i to the minus one, which we can do by using this local uniform Lipschitz condition that we had in the definition of a passive strict decay. So in that way, we can get rid of the sigma i to the minus one, we just get some Lipschitz constant and the rest we can estimate by using the inequality above. All right, and in that way, we, we prove our theory. So good. Now, of course, um, well, the most critical assumption in our theorem was the existence of a pulse of strict decay. This seems to be a quite complicated object and it's not clear if uh, that exists or how it can be constructed. Now, let me say some things about the construction of the pulse of strict decay. And you will see uh, there are actually really uh, some, I would say, uh, severe problems related to that. And not all of these problems are already solved. So maybe you know that for finite networks, in the case of finite networks, one usually considers a small gain condition, which looks like this. So in terms of the gain operator, which is also called the no joint increase condition. This just means that the vector gamma of S should have at least one component, gamma i of s, which is strictly less than the component si. So in one component, we should always have um, a strict decay. This condition in the case of finite networks already guarantees the existence of a passive strict decay. But 
in the infinite dimensional case, as we have here, it turns out to be much too weak, unfortunately. So somehow we try to replace it by some stronger condition. And here is a definition which turns out to be useful. So this is something stronger than this um, small gain condition. We call it the robot small gain condition. And this says that there exists, there should exist a K infinity function omega such that for all indices i and j, <clears throat> the operator that you see here, which is also a monotone operator on the positive cone, satisfies this no joint increase condition. So what is this operator? Here we have EI, which I did not define, but it's just the i's unit vector in L infinity. So that's just the vector which has a one at the i's position and zeros at all others. So this operator gamma ij uh, is defined as the sum of the operator gamma and well, something which is only non-zero in the i's component. And it's multiplied here with omega of sj. So it is somehow involves the i's component and the j's component. So for every pair ij, this operator should satisfy the no joint increase condition. And it turns out that this is a nice property. We can prove some things if we assume that it holds. In particular, we can prove the proposition that you see here. If gamma satisfies the condition, then we can define another operator that we call Q. And this is defined as the supremum over all the iterates, gamma K of S over all uh, non-negative case. So when I say supremum, I have to explain what it means because these are vectors. I take the supremum, supremum component wise. That's the, def that's the meaning of the supremum. So this operator turns out to be well-defined, which means that it takes values again in the positive cone and it satisfies some nice properties. First property, Q of S is always bounded above and below, below by S, because S appears here, of course, if we take K equal to zero, so that's clear, but it's bounded above also by the inverse of omega applied to the norm of S, the L infinity norm, multiplied with the vector, which consists of only ones. So that just means in each component, Q of S, is upper bounded by omega inverse of the norm of S. So second property, that's the more important one, which already leads to something like pass of strict decay. That property says that if we evaluate gamma at any uh, point Q of S, so any point in the image of Q, then we have maybe not strict decay, but we have a decay. So gamma of Q of S is less than or equal to Q of S for all S. Okay, now we need uh, one additional thing to actually make use of the operator Q to construct the pass of strict decay. One thing that is missing is we need to analyze the stability properties of the system which is induced by the gain operator. So that's a discrete time system on the positive cone just like that. And we can prove some things about this system. If we assume that gamma is a well-defined continuous and satisfies the robot small gain condition, namely, then it holds that the system is uniformly globally stable. And we can prove that every tra trajectory of the system converges to zero component wise which means that if we consider just one component, so we compose gamma to the K with the projection to the ice component, then we get a sequence of real numbers, which will converge to zero. Unfortunately, that's not enough because we need a little bit more to construct the pass of strict decay. We need the global attractivity of the system. 
So that means we would need this convergence to zero to be uniform or expressed differently, we need the convergence with respect to the L infinity norm. We need that the norm of gamma K of S goes to zero, which unfortunately we are not able to prove under these assumptions. But now let us just assume that this property holds and then I can show you how you can construct a pass of strict decay. So it gets a little bit more complicated, but not much because we need to consider instead of gamma, uh, like a scaled version of gamma. We need to compose gamma with something like identity plus another K infinity function, which you should think of as being small. So, and again, this composition means that we apply identity plus theta to each component of gamma. And now we assume that not gamma, but this new operator, gamma theta satisfies the robot small gain condition. Then we can write down a candidate for a pass of strict decay, which is this function. So sigma of R is defined as, well, the value of the Q operator induced by gamma theta at R1. So that's the vector which consists well, which has all entries being equal to R. And here is again the definition of the Q operator associated with gamma theta. Now we can use our proposition, which tells us that we have this inequality. But gamma theta is nothing but identity plus theta composed with gamma. So we can take identity plus theta to the other side of the inequality and we get that gamma evaluated at sigma of r will be less than or equal to this and this is exactly what we need this is exactly the first property of a pass of strict decay so that's nice but what about the other properties well one property that we had in this definition was that sigma i should be uniformly bounded below and above by some K infinity functions. And this property we also get, we get it from that property here very directly. And you see we have here the identity as a lower bound and omega to the minus one as an upper bound essentially. In particular, this implies that sigma i is zero at zero it's positive elsewhere and it goes to infinity as r goes to infinity. But we need to, of course, we need to know more. We need to prove that sigma i is a k infinity function. This can be done by exploiting the global attractivity, which we will assume now for the system which is induced by gamma theta. So we assume that this system is globally attractive. So every trajectory goes to zero in norm. That implies that the Q theta actually can be written as, instead of a supremum over all K, can be written as a maximum over only finitely many K. Well, not everywhere, but at least on sufficiently small sets or balls, it can be written in that way because gamma theta k of s will go to zero. So after a certain index k zero, it will be so small that it does not contribute anymore to this supremum. So now as we can write it as a maximum over finitely many numbers, we immediately get the continuity because we have a maximum of finitely many continuous functions. So we get the continuity, continuity of Q theta, which directly implies the continuity of sigma i. Now to prove that sigma i is K infinity function, there's only one thing missing, which is that sigma i is, should be strictly increasing. But like using the same idea as here, we can actually write sigma i also as a maximum of finitely many strictly increasing functions, at least locally. 
Here we also need, or here we also use that every subsystem only has finitely many neighbors together with this property. And this eventually tells us that sigma i is a k-infinity function. Now, there's only one thing missing from the definition of a path of strict decay, which is the Lipschitz property. For the Lipschitz property, well, we need to impose another assumption or condition, which is this one. We assume that for each compact interval k in zero infinity, we have uniform Lipschitz bounds for the gamma ij, so for the internal gains. Like we have these estimates from above and from below, for, at least for all the gamma ij's which are not equal to zero, we have these estimates. And we can show that if that holds, then we get the uniform local Lipschitz estimates for sigma i inverse. And this is enough then to show that the sigma is a path of strict decay. So let me summarize. We can construct the path of strict decay for gamma under the following three assumptions. This gamma theta for some small theta satisfies a robust small gain condition. The system induced by gamma theta is globally attractive. And we have a uniform local Lipschitz condition for the internal gains gamma ij, as you can see here. So this is what we can prove. Now, of course, we have some open problems. Well, one of the main problems is to find checkable and sufficiently weak conditions, which guarantee that a system like that induced by a gain operator is globally attractive. So far, we have some sufficient conditions, but they all seem to be too strong, which means they are probably only satisfied for a very narrow class of gain operators. Then the construction of the ISS Lyapunov function that I showed you is not very direct because it involves the inverses of those sigma i's, which are practically unknown because you don't really know uh, this operator q that is used to define them. Well, we also don't know how to generalize, generalize the construction of a path of strict decay, for instance, to gain operators which are not of this subtype, because this is only, a, of course, a special case of gain operator or a special case of how to formulate uh, the ISS definition using a supremum over gains. You could also use a sum or something else. And finally, I would say that we don't really know enough good and interesting examples to which we can apply this theory. Right, now I already come to my last slide where I show you some references. So, um, well, the theory, the theorem that I showed you, you can find in the first paper here, which is so far only on archive. Then uh, we also have another paper, the second one here with uh, Navid Norosi as a co-author, which um, specializes this analysis to networks where all the, in the internal gain functions are linear functions. In this paper, we also generalize the gain operators a little bit. So we not only consider subtype operators, but yeah, some more general class of, of gain operators. Then some of the results that I told you, or let's say like some of the theoretical basis of this, you find in the third paper here, which is co-authored also by Jochen Glück. And so this paper considers not the Lyapunov approach to input to state stability, but the trajectory formulation. And then there are, well, this fourth paper here is a paper which is somewhat related to our work because it also considers infinite interconnections of nonlinear control systems and also considers a small gain approach to input to state stability. But the main difference to our work is that in this paper, 
the assumption on the internal gains is, is much more restrictive because in this paper, the authors assume that all the internal gains are less than identity, which we don't. Then there, then there are some uh, general papers, I would say, that you should read if you're interested in ISS for infinite dimensional systems, which are these two. Um, this paper um, is also about ISS of infinite networks of nonlinear systems, but with somewhat different assumptions. Like for instance, here we can also consider linear gains and we model the network on an LP space for finite P and not an L infinity. And we also talk about uh, exponential ISS, right? And finally, there's a now classical paper from which we drew a lot of ideas, which is this one by Dashkowski, Rüffer and Wirth, which basically contains like some of the fundamental results for finite networks on the small gain approach to input to state stability. Good, that was it. So thank you for listening. <laughs>